right, uh, welcome back to the Bevan series. Yes. Feel the excitement in the audience. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Daniel Schindler. I'm a faculty here in SAFS and uh, one of the organizers or the lead organizer of uh, this year's session um, or symposium or whatever it's called, seminar series. And uh, as we talked about previously, the, the seminar series this year is set up around a couple of key issues. The last couple of weeks we talked about whaling and today and next week we're going to talk about protected areas in the ocean. And we realize this is a complex topic with many different perspectives, but we've chosen two different speakers who are, will offer alternative but probably complementary perspectives on what MPAs can do for us. Um, and uh, anyhow, today is, is Elliot Norse, uh, next week is uh, Patrick Christie from, from SMEA. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, Kiki Jenkins, a professor from SMEA, to introduce today's speaker. Thanks. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Elliot Norris. I've known Elliot for about 10 years. He's very good friends with my PhD advisor, Larry Crowder. And so Elliot would come to the Duke Marine Lab and give us guest lectures and collaborate. And there's a number of things that I have marked about Elliot over the time. First is that when you see him, you get greeted with a big smile and a hug. Um, and with someone who has a nearly 40 year career in the trenches, really in the trenches of marine conservation, I think that's a rarity to still be greeted with a smile. And I, I think that's a mark of the fact that Elliot has a true passion and an optimism for the work that he does. The other thing that you recognize about Elliot is that he is a big idea guy. He thinks about novel ideas. He's always pushing the vanguard. When I go to AAAS and I flip to and try to find all the marine stuff, I'm particularly looking for the session that Marine Conservation Institute has done that year because invariably they have their pulse on the thing that's coming. I remember the year they did the IEU fishing and people were like, IEU fishing, what's that? And then three or four years later, the whole world's talking about it. And so Elliot's very good at that. Marine Conservation Institute is very good about that. And I think that has marked his entire career that he's been at the first. He helped organize the first IMCC, International Marine Con Conservation Co Congress, first and the second. Um, he co-edited the first textbook on marine conservation biology. He coined the term biological diversity. Those types of big idea thinking is, is what he does. And when I sat as a graduate student thinking, well, how is it he's had this career? The hallmark is his diversity, that he got his PhD doing blue crab ecology, which is awesome because across crustaceans rock. And then he spent some time in academia as a postdoc, went to government, was at the EPA, went to NGO World, was at the Ecological Society of America and Ocean Conservancy before he found his own NGO, the Marine Conservation Institute. But that path has made him a very effective player because he gets the sectors. He gets what motivates them. And I think it's that that allows him to position himself and position MCI to be able to do big things like the Pacific um, Remote Islands Marine National Monument that was about recognizing that presidents want to leave a legacy. They want to look good in their second term. And if you're positioned well and been thinking in advance and have a little bit of luck, then big things can happen. Um, but the other thing that I think about, despite all the, in looking at these big things, I think about a quote that Larry would often say, and he says, if people, if someone isn't upset at the work that you do, then maybe your work isn't that important. And with Elliot, he does important work, but some people are upset at what he does. But that's okay. And today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the positives, the potential negatives, how we manage them, how we weigh the costs and the benefits of having large marine reserves. And with that, Elliot Norse. You are so. Okay, so my question, uh, can those of you in the back hear me okay? Am I coming across higher? Oh boy, okay. So I am going to be shouting and I'm going to ask your forgiveness if I'm too loud. You can always, in the back, the people in the back have the privilege of going down. The people in front, well, you may have to suffer, okay? But I want to say thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to see faces I have known for decades. It's a pleasure to see faces I haven't met yet and everything in between. I hope this will be um, useful. Uh, um, 
provocative, inspiring. Uh, you might even laugh. Uh, just don't do it in the wrong places. Okay, but I don't want to tell you which those places are because this is, this is your gig. I'm just here to entertain. Um, what I'm interested in is talking about a new thing that has a big purpose, and that is preventing mass extinction on this planet. That, that may seem bigger than the things we usually talk about. And I'm OK with that. So I just wanted to say I want to thank the, the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences and, and the, the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs and my old friends and my new friends. I want to thank Lance and his gang, several of whom are here and brilliant. Uh, I want to thank the wonderful people who have been advising us on putting together the Global Ocean Refuge System, Glories. And I want to thank the people who have been writing checks so far, not big enough, but, but checks big enough to keep us evolving this idea. And I want to say you, uh, to you, thank you for coming out on a Thursday afternoon. I don't know how long this runs. I know it's less than three hours. So, <laughs> So it's not going to be the length of a Fidel Castro speech or a Bill Clinton speech. And I will try to go at a pace that will work for you. And bear with me if I get excited and I take longer than I should. The, the first thing I want to do is, is give you a caveat and an apology. Okay? And I should explain. Um, our ship is on fire. And like this Chinese factory trawler in Antarctica, we're not only on fire, but we're a long way from rescuers. And that means we're all going to die, or we're going to save ourselves. Now, I, that's a choice. We, we get to choose which of those things we're going to do. But don't expect somebody to come and rescue you. This is, we're, 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 we're at bat now. We're, we're, we're in the spotlight, and I am hoping that we do the right thing, whatever that right thing is. I have ideas about it, and I'm going to offer a vision for it, but I hope we do it. Um, I also have to point out that I owe you guys an apology, and that is I'm looking at this room, and there are an awful lot of young people here. And on behalf of the baby boom generation, I was born in the years right after World War II, I have to apologize for you because we were given what could be considered a sacred trust, and we have not done a very good job with what we've been entrusted with. And now that we've really, really messed it up, along with the older people, you know, the people in the Elvis generation, I'm in the Beatles generation, right? Um, I have to say I'm sorry to all of you, but especially I want to say I'm sorry to those of you in the millennial generation because we left a real mess for you, and we haven't so far been able to clean it up. And I'm hoping that we will take a step toward doing that today. So please accept my apology. So I want to, I want to talk with you about three things. Okay, and this is really a sequence. So I, I, I believe in things happening in threes and fives in particular. And Lance Morgan, Lance, could you wave at people? Lance, who's our president, and I don't know you see eye to eye on that one because he sees a lot of things in fours. And so I'm a three and five kind of guy. Please forgive me. So here's my three, and you'll see a lot of threes in this. I want to talk with you about how we came to the point where we are of of dealing with something as big as we are because it's a lot more tractable to deal with small things than big things, it seems. We, I want to talk about, about the threat. I'm going to yell for you is what I'm going to do, okay? Because, yeah, it's, it's not safe for me to be touching this. Okay? Okay. And so what we want to talk about is the thing that keeps me up at night and wakes me up in the 
fours and fives many days. And then we want to talk about a solution that we think could actually work. And, and there are all sorts of solutions in the world, but ones that work are relatively few and far between. And I want to share the idea that we've been working on with you. So just so you know, I was a kid once, and uh, this was my neighborhood, a working class neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, on an estuary. That's what I looked like when I was five. And the reason that's relevant is because I got exposure to the marine environment really early. And I fell in love with the living things in that environment. I thought they were the neatest things in the world. They were my friends, they were my teachers, and I decided um, I wanted to become a, a student of them. I wanted to learn everything I could about them and spend my life on them. So I asked my mother, what do you call a person who does that? And she went to the public library and asked the librarian. The librarian says, he's an ichthyologist. And so in a neighborhood where all of the other people who were five years old, wanted to be policemen or firemen or mommies or nurses. That's the options that were open in those days. I wanted to be a marine biologist. I didn't know the word for it, so I called it an ichthyologist. But as it turns out, that actually happened, which is really, really cool. Now, I have to point out that I had another love, and my other love was prehistoric life. I was just fascinated to learn about things that used to be on this earth and are no longer. And that was, that was a constant theme in my life because I felt a special responsibility. I felt like Atlas, that my job was to help hold up the earth. And the reasons for that are long and would take a little bit of an explanation. And I don't want to take too much of your time. So I'll pass on that for now. We can always go back over it if that's really of any interest. It's personal and eclectic, and it probably wouldn't apply to a lot of you, but it sure did me. But here's something that you probably know about history and that includes my history, and that is in October 1962, we almost had global thermonuclear war. And since I lived in New York, that would have been uh, a very personal thing for me. And we're, we're, this was important in shaping me because what it, what it told me is that things can happen without our knowing or intending that they happen, and they can catch us unawares. And that's, uh, you know, that's like finding out Santa Claus isn't real. It's a disturbing thing to find out that all the security and all the peace and all the love that you know could go away very quickly. But 62 was a really, really big year for another reason, besides the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's the year that this amazing scientist wrote a book that wasn't about marine biology, but was about pesticides and people and our society. And she was, she was my mother. My father is Aldo Leopold. My mother is Rachel Carson. Uh, uh, they never met, but <laughs> irrelevant. They were my parents. And, and Rachel published Silent Spring, and it changed my life. She really got my attention. So in the same year, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we had Silent Spring. That, that's attention getting. OK, so I just want you to know I was an academic. I actually was legit once. OK, got a PhD, did a postdoc. I did you know, all the right things. And uh, these were the organisms I worked on. So you may notice that there's something here. I played with blue crabs and started catching them at five years old. And then I wound up getting my PhD and my postdoc, studying their ecology, their geographical ecology, behavior, physiology, and stuff like that. So there's this thing again and again and again. I go back to my roots. 
And as it turns out, I really needed a lot of blue crabs to understand their distribution in gradients from terrestrially dominated to marine dominated ecosystems. And I was told the best way to get large numbers of blue crabs, because I could catch 20 or 50 in a day, and I was told, you want to get 1,000 in a day? You want to get thousands in a day? Go board a shrimp trawler. And so I did. And I took this picture in 1971. You can see a lot of blue crabs here, a lot more blue crabs than shrimp, OK? And what did this mean? It made me wonder, could this be having any effect on our planet? And I say that because I would look at the little town of San Felipe in Baja, California, and I saw 100 shrimp trawlers tied up, and I knew how big their nets were, and I knew they dragged them along the seafloor. And I wasn't very good at arithmetic, but it occurred to me that this may be meaningful. So that was, that was when I was just a humble graduate student. So after I got my PhD, I, I couldn't get a great job. I was only willing to get a great job. I wanted to be at a great university with great colleagues and with great postdocs and students and stuff like that. And the only offer I got at that time was from a really, really bad school. It was, uh, I, I, I won't say its name, but it was a, it was a high school for college age students, okay? It was, it, was a, it was a university where if you got home at the end of the day thinking that maybe somebody heard you at some point while they were rioting, that was a good thing. And I just didn't want a job like that, and so I didn't take it. And instead, I took a job, a summer job, a two-month internship at the US Environmental Protection Agency. And as it turns out, that was a life-changing event for me. Now, I got to tell you that it was a really, really lonely field. Marine conservation left <sighs> lots and lots of room for expansion, shall I say, in those days. And I got lucky. I got lucky. I got hired by the White House because they thought I had pluck. They liked my philosophy. They thought I was well trained too, but that wasn't the big thing. They said they can get, you know, I mean, they could empty out the holes of Harvard if need be. They liked my pluck because I really believed in this stuff. And so my boss said, Elliot, for the 1980 annual report of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, we want you to write something really big. And I said, wow, okay, what? And he said, I want you to write a chapter on the status of life on Earth. Okay, so that, that's, you know, that's a large topic. <laughs> and, and I decided to accept the challenge because I thought it would be really fun. And so we began with the story of a keystone species in North Pacific ecosystems Stellar's sea cow. And this is an icon personally for me because the story of Stellar's sea cow is one that encapsulates much of what I know about marine conservation, even though it's a very short story and it works something like this. Um, a Russian ship with a Danish captain and a... And a and a German naturalist aboard uh, went across the Pacific, discovered Alaska for the first time. On coming back, it ran aground on something called Copper Island at the very end of the Aleutian chain, the islands we call Komondorskis today. They're on the Russian side of the international date line. And the men aboard the ship almost died, but they were able to kill and eat these gigantic whale size, I mean, you know, 10 ton animals. And when they managed to get off the island and get back to Russia, they did the only decent thing to thank Stellar's sea cow for 
having saved their lives. They told everybody else about it, and everybody said, do you mean while we go hunt for sea otter pelts, we can eat these things? And they did. And 27 years after Western civilization discovered stellar sea cow, the last one drew its breath. Okay, that was, uh, that was impressive, I think. So I want to explain what I mean. The reason I was so excited about doing this chapter is because I saw that there were really three different separate conservation movements. There was a conservation movement that was dealing with what they called germplasm of crop and livestock varieties. Nobody ever talked about wild species having you know, genetic diversity. But they talked about the genetic diversity within crops and livestock. There was a group of conservationists who were really concerned about species at high risk. And there was a group of conservationists who were really devoted to the idea of protecting the iconic places, the places that were really, really special for some reason, often a scenic reason. And those separate branches of conservation being separate, it occurred to me, was really not a good thing. We needed something to bring them together. And it also occurred that there were three evolutionary stages in conservation. So it was a stage that focused on useful life. And the definition of useful is if you can shoot it or hook it or saw it um, or you know, put it on your wounds and it'll heal you or whatever, that's a useful species. The heck with the rest of them. Um, much more recent stage was the stage that said species that are endangered should not be driven off the face of the earth. Okay? I mean, the bald eagle in the United States was an example of this. It was our national symbol. It was an abundant thing when we came to North America. We say we discovered it, although there had been people here for, you know, 13,000 years by that point. But in any event, um, bald eagle was headed for extinction. And there was a whole movement that grew up around iconic organisms to try to save them from that fate. And then there was a movement of people who were interested in saving all kinds of life, not only things that are demonstrably useful or demonstrably endangered, but all life, because all life supports one another and us. Okay, they're important for their own right, they're important for us. And so what I called it was biological diversity, which Ed Wilson later shortened to biodiversity and that took off because uh, it, 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 it rolls off the tongue a little better. And that is diversity within populations, diversity of different species, and diversity among ecosystem types. And that idea was the, the thing that I think changed my whole life and set my whole course. Now, I, I, I like metrics and measures are a good thing. And so what I want you to know is that Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize in, what was it, 1919? For relativity. But biodiversity, despite the fact it's a much newer concept, is a larger part of the world dialogue now than relativity. There are three times as many Google hits, and you can see that it was around 1997 that biodiversity was mentioned more often in books than relativity. And yet, we don't think about biodiversity as being nearly as important as we think about relativity. I mean, what was that movie recently, Matthew McConaughey and Jessica Chastain and Interstellar? Okay, that movie is not about biodiversity. We haven't had a big biodiversity movie for a long time. But Interstellar is way cool. Okay? Well, I think biodiversity is way cool. And it's not only biodiversity I liked, but I liked thinking about this. And so I got a real break when I was the public policy director of the Ecological Society of America because my hero, 
Paul Ehrlich, and a guy I had never met until then, but who was really famous, Carl Sagan, asked me to copy edit their book because they wanted to get it out real fast. The, 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 the conference had been held, and they wanted to get this book out literally and to the presses within weeks. And so I was pressed into service, and not as a scientist so much as a, as a writer who got the science, and they involved me in it, and The Cold and the Dark came out. And the reason it was important is because The Cold and the Dark had a message that really, really was needed during the Reagan administration. The message was, if we have a nuclear war, it's not, not going to just kill the Soviets. It's not just going to kill the Americans. It's going to be a global event because nuclear weapons would set off an atmospheric changes that they dubbed nuclear winter. And I got to meet Paul Crutzen and Alan Robach and really, really brilliant scientists who, who worked on the idea of what happens in the atmosphere is really important to what happens to societies and living things on this planet. So I, I got lucky. And having worked on one book, I thought, gee, you know, this is easy. I can do this. So the, I, I, working for the Ecological Society, the Wilderness Society asked us to pull together a book on applying the concept of biological diversity to national forests. And I said, I can do this. This is not hard. I don't know anything about forests. But other than that, this is OK. So I got a bunch of people who did know about forests, and I knew about biodiversity. And we put together the Green Book. And that was successful enough so that I was asked to move to Seattle and pull this book together. Uh, so all of a sudden, I was working on forests. And I came to the University of Washington, and I talked with really, really smart people here and at Oregon State University and in other places, and learned the Northwest Forest game. And I was able to pull the different strands together that my academic colleagues had, had woven. And I pulled them together into something that was more or less coherent. And as it turns out, it was really useful. The Clinton administration used it to craft the Northwest Forest Plan. And, and, and I just have to say thank you to people who were wonderful to me, people like Jerry Franklin, who taught me about forest structure and function and course Woody degree, people like Gordon Orians, who knew so much about conservation biology, whether we were talking about icterid birds or bupressed beetles like these. I mean, these people were wonderful to me. They took me under their wing, and it, it was like getting a second PhD. I mean, even to this day, I probably irritate hell out of Lance, but I call myself a marine and forest conservation biologist, even though I haven't done anything on forests for several decades. OK, so as it turns out, finally, you, you, if you stay in the right place long enough, Sooner or later, you wind up coming back to where you want to be. And I got hired to make marine biodiversity a policy issue, a national and global policy issue. And not knowing exactly what I was doing, I got together a bunch of folks I had met over time who were really smart, who were really thoughtful, and who could give me the picture of what, what's the status of the oceans. And so we held this workshop in 1990. And they were great. And their conclusion was the entire marine realm is at risk. I didn't know that was true. I had made the assumption that the land was a mess and the oceans were in pretty good shape, except for you know, Puget Sound and, and, and Chesapeake Bay and the North Sea and little surrounded places around the edges. But I thought the oceans as a whole were in pretty good shape. And they told me no. And so I figured I had a lot more to learn. And so I moved to Friday Harbor Laboratories. And while everybody else was doing research, I was sitting in the library day and night reading the journals and books and talking with the researchers who taught me marine biology 
again after an absence in the field of, oh, about six, seven years. And it was great. And I owe UW big time. Because at Friday Harbor, I started assembling this book. And the reason was that we knew the Earth Summit was happening in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. And we wanted, for the first time, the global conversation on conservation to include the oceans. And so this was about getting the oceans as part of that global conversation. And it worked. OK? And one of the things that was in the book is it said, we need a science of marine conservation biology. So ultimately, I quit my job, and I founded Marine Conservation Biology. And not realizing how difficult that would be, I started surrounding myself with really smart people who could make me look good. And, uh, and as it turns out, it's been pretty useful. So we wanted, you figured, how do you create a new science? Okay, and the answer is you hold a party, you have um, a Bible, and you bring the money. Okay, I mean, those are the things. So the parties we held were at University of Victoria and San Francisco State University. And those turned out to be really good. At the first one at U Victoria, I remember, Carl Safina was talking with me, and he was looking at Jane Lubchenco talking with Bob Payne on the lawn on an unusual, beautiful, warm day in Victoria, you know, between sessions. And he looked at me, and he said, Elliot, this is Woodstock. Yeah. <laughs> and it, for me, it was Woodstock. He was right. So. And we started doing stuff. We held a workshop in our first month, uh, the first global, the first workshop, scientific workshop, on the global effects of bottom trolling on marine ecosystems. And Les Watling and I wrote it up for conservation biology, and it started a movement to deal with bottom trolling. And we documented, for the first time I knew about, although I didn't know that Callum Roberts was doing it at the same time, we documented modern extinctions in the sea. Not extinctions that happened in, in paleo times, but extinctions that were happening within the last several hundred years, and in a lot of cases, in several tens of years. We also wanted to look at, at a comparison of, commer of, of the impacts of commercial fishing gears. And Lance was, by that time, uh, a key player at Marine Conservation Institute. And he led the analysis. Lance also led this analysis. We wanted to take the idea that Michael Soule and colleagues had about looking at conservation on a continental scale. and so. We pulled together a Baja California to the Bering Sea priority conservation areas effort. And this book of Lance's, I think, has really changed the way people look at marine conservation. And I'm really proud of that. And of course, I said, we, we needed a party. We needed a Bible. And so I, I with the help of friends, pulled together what I hoped would be a canonical reading for people, and it's turned out to be pretty useful. Okay, and again, I had to have Stellar's Sea Cow on the cover because I, I commissioned Ray Troll to do that piece of art because I thought its role in the North Pacific ecosystem and its absence are so important. Uh, another person in this room, John Gannat. John, come on, let's embarrass you did something brilliant and important by looking at the effects of ocean acidification on marine ecosystems wherever he could find the information around the world. So again and again, we're taking on what we think are pretty big things. We're not looking at one little place and one little issue that's not extrapolable. We try to find the commonalities among things that happen in many places and see if we can understand overall patterns. So most recent time that 
we've done this that I've been involved in was this one. We asked the question, can we fish in the deep sea sustainably? And so we got together a team of really, really smart people in a number of different fields. And I think we have gotten a pretty good synthetic take on the answer to that question. Now, I got to tell you, something that feels good is it's not so lonely anymore. From the time I started to 2008, which is the last time Google Books has data, um, mentions of marine conservation increased 600%. That's not enough. 10,000% would have been better, but it's a substantial increase. And the reason that's become so important to me is a historical context. And that is, since the Cambrian explosion, it's been about 540 million years. And the history of life on Earth has been an uneven and dramatic one, because there have been five mass extinction events. And uh, since, at least since the Cambrian explosion of life, the most recent one was 66 million years ago. And you know, that gets me to thinking, because each time this happened, it took out at least 60% of the species. It took out lots of higher taxa. I mean, it, it, it's, been, it's been a big thing, okay? And I will point out that John's good friend, Charlie Verin, has said that he thinks ocean acidification in each of these five cases has been a major driver of these mass extinction events. So a hero, a far-seeing person who is in this room, uh, wrote a book that I read, and I was blown away by its astuteness. This person, Peter Ward, said there's mounting evidence that the third gigantic extinction event, I mean, even bigger than the other mass extinctions, is, is, is starting. And that really, really got my attention. I mean, here we are just doing our thing, you know? We eat, we build houses, we drive, we make love, we, we uh, watch television, and we've started a mass extinction. This is scary stuff. I, I might point out that, that this idea is something that has increased dramatically since, again, uh, I got into the game. And so obviously more and more people are thinking about this and writing about this. And, and so it's gotten my attention. And my old buddy, Stuart Pym, who I've known since my Ecological Society days, Frida. Uh, Stuart says that extinction rates are now about 1,000-fold higher, not 1,000%, but 1,000 times higher than they were before major human impacts, uh, industrialization and such. So anytime something increases by a factor of 1,000, to me, that gets attention. And there are many reasons why it's important, but since climate is far more important in the eyes of many people than marine biodiversity, I'll give you a climate reason. It's about fish poop, okay? You know, the most abundant fishes in the world, it seems, are, are mesopelagic fish like these lantern fishes, and they eat in the surface waters at night when the predators can't see them, and during the day they sink down into the deep and poop the carbon they gathered in the shallows. And by doing that, they're taking carbon out of the atmosphere and taking carbon out of the shallows and sending it into the deep sea, which means that the deep sea is a carbon bank thanks to marine biodiversity. Ooh, what an idea. What an idea. And so my conclusion is, and I don't think I'm the only one who realizes this, is that the oceans maintain the conditions essential for life on Earth. Not all life. 
there are organisms living within the geosphere in very hot conditions. You know, they're microorganisms, single-celled organisms, and they would do okay without marine biodiversity, maybe. But for the rest of us, and that means you and me, too, we need these little tiny things and these great big things because nature operates both bottom up and top down, right? We need these things to be okay so we can be okay. And the reason is because you probably wouldn't be around, want to be around, during a mass extinction. A mass extinction would ruin your, your whole day. Okay? And I know that may sound funny, but um, I have been to bad parties, and I have been to bad speeches, and I have been beaten up by bullies, and I've had a lot of bad things happen, but nothing like this. So the question I think we really need to ask ourselves is, can we stop it? Can we stop it from happening? And so Lance and I have been talking for a long time now, and we were impressed by the literature that says that an awful lot of things that survived, survived in refugia, whose, whose positions and rough size we can deduce or we can document. For example, Maher documented how Yellowstone National Park saved bison. Okay, I mean, that's one of the reasons it was set up. And so the idea that there are places where living things can survive, even if they've been wiped out everywhere else, is a powerful one for us. And it's really, really hard for those of you who hate the idea of protected areas to refute. Because if they hadn't had a place to survive, you wouldn't be here. And I wouldn't be here. So thinking about this a little more, what we realized is that on land, if you want to protect crop germplasm, which is vitally important for people, you set up secure seed banks, like the global seed vault in Svalbard in the Arctic Ocean. Okay? So the question is, how do we do this in the ocean? How do we do it in the ocean? Well, the problem is that we don't know how to maintain most things in the ocean. We don't know how to do it. This humpback whale and these shearwaters in this picture and practically everything else you can see in this picture can't be raised in captivity. Can't, we can't do it. You, you, we, we, you, can't, you can't do it. So if you're going to do it, you've got to do it in nature. You've got to do it where they live, where they want to be. Right? And that leads to the conclusion that other people had made, that marine protected areas were a really powerful tool. And the reason they're a really powerful tool boils down to this. Because some important things occur only in certain places. Places matter. And protecting places, it doesn't require nearly as much knowledge, and it's much cheaper than managing species one by one. Now, I have come to the University of Washington to proclaim that. I'm not going to fight with you about it. If you want to disagree, disagree after I go, because time is short. But what I want to tell you is it's pretty hard to come to another conclusion. I don't have to know anything about the population biology of a Poganophoran worm that hasn't been discovered yet to maintain it to keep it from extinction, all I have to do is save enough places where they live and they're likely to continue on, even though I don't know what they are, what they eat, how they reproduce, when they reproduce, and all that stuff that we love to know. So these areas can work because these organisms, having been molded by three and a half billion years of evolution on Earth, feed themselves and reproduce themselves without any help from us. They're really smart. We came on the scene pretty late, and they were already doing pretty good. Okay? So I figure, okay, bless you. Just keep doing it. We'll provide you the places. Now, it's good to have science behind you when you 
think about something that big. And so there was good science. And the good science was by a group of people. The, 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 the mental leader, I think, was Jane Lubchenco. And she had a whole bunch of them up and down the West Coast, including here and Oregon State and others. And she looked at places that were weakly protected versus ones that were strongly protected. And what she found was really robust. She and her gang found that the no-take reserves have higher diversity, higher biomass, larger and more numerous fishes and invertebrates and things like that. In other words, if you compare them, you find there's more stuff in the protected areas, real protected areas, than elsewhere. Now, I have to point out that there's always a pill at every party, and there are some people who assert that this doesn't work. Uh, Camilo Mora and Peter Sale say it doesn't work. I guess they've never been to Serengeti National Park, where the thing that you have to worry about most is stepping in poop or getting run over by millions of, of animals that didn't read the literature that says that protected areas don't work. But there's truth in it, too. And we need to be good scientists and admit the truth. One truth is that most marine protected areas are in places that nobody wants. OK? And that's because governments are scared stiff of user groups. And I might point out, it's not only federal governments, that's state governments, that's even state institutions and things like that. Let me go no further. The point is, they're afraid of opposition. OK? Another truth. Most marine protected areas are weakly protective. Like, I worked in national marine sanctuaries for a number of years. I worked on them to try to get them designated. And then I realized, well, you know, most of them are really, really weakly protected. Maybe they stop oil and gas development. But they don't stop other, much more harmful activities like bottom trawling. Hmm, that's a problem. Here's another truth. There are people who don't follow the rules, OK? And they, they do IUU fishing. And that includes in these protected places. And that's not a good thing. So protected places don't do any good unless those protections are enforced. And here's another truth. There are things that marine protected areas can stop at their boundaries. And there are things they can't. They can't stop the warming temperatures of coral bleaching. They can't stop ocean acidification. They can't stop infestations of lionfish crossing their borders. I'm not saying they're useless when it comes to them, but they can't stop them from invading, crossing their boundaries, transgressing okay, their boundaries. Here's another truth. Okay? The big things that are disappearing fastest are much more abundant in MPAs that have certain sets of characteristics. They have to be strongly protected in law and in fact, OK, enforced. They have to be around for long enough. You can't start an MPA today and look tomorrow and say, you know, there's not much more life in here than there was yesterday. They've got to be pretty large in many cases, and they have to be isolated from things that would drain their populations because the organisms are too dumb to know that they've gone beyond the border. And yet, if you look, even some really small marine protected areas show the reserve effects, show much greater abundance of life inside than outside. I've been to the Metis Islands. I got to tell you, the Metis Islands Marine Reserve off of Catalonia in Spain is 0.97 square kilometers, OK? Not exactly what I would call colossal, but it's the only place I know in the Mediterranean, and there are, there are others, but it's the only place I've ever seen that actually has large numbers of large fish. How interesting. I saw big groupers and sparrows and things like that in the Metis Islands and haven't seen them anywhere else. And neither have much more knowledgeable people like my friend Enrique Sala and Fio McKelly, et cetera. So let me give you the numbers. And these numbers are not very up to date. They were from yesterday, OK? Uh, from mpatlas.org, which 
Lance and his team started a couple of years ago. And we keep track of MPAs, and now the number we have is 11,333. They cover a little more than 2% of the ocean, and the area that's no take is a little less than 1%. So we haven't exactly knocked ourselves out creating these things. So when I ask, other than the people who will hate conservation no matter what, what's really wrong with MPAs, my answers are this. Most of them are not located well. Most don't have strong legal protection. Most aren't enforced well enough. And there aren't enough of them. That's what Camilla Mora said. You know, MPAs don't work because there aren't enough of them. I sort of agree with them. Is this fixable? Yeah. And the question is how? And I think what we need to do is get governments to get off their butts and accelerate designation of these areas while there's still time. So just so you know, I have dealt with things that everybody knows all my career. And sometimes things that everybody knows is right. And sometimes things that everybody knows is not right. And here's one of the things that everybody knew, and I was always told. They can either be big or they can be strong, but they can't be big and strong. Now, I don't know if you know that construction. Let me give you another one that I hope will make you smile. There are old hang gliders, and there are bold hang gliders, but there are no old, bold hang gliders, OK? Well, it's the same with marine protected areas. They're, they can't be big or strongly and strongly protected. Not believing this, um, I got my friend, the guy on the right, Jim Greenwood, who was one of our board members and a former Republican congressman, to get us a meeting with the Bush administration in 2005, and that led to designation of three huge no-take marine protected areas in the Pacific in 2006 and 2009. And when I say huge, what I really mean is together these three MPAs were bigger than Washington and California together. Nobody had ever done that before, ever. And it started a movement. And we're caught up in this movement, too, but now there are others in the movement. And it's really making a difference. So this past year, we got President Obama to dramatically expand the area of Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. And it's now the biggest protected area in the world. OK? So that's something that, you know, I mean, when everything is going bad, you can, you can look at that and say, I was here at least for this. So a really smart guy said that if you don't like the existing model, instead of complaining about it, make a better one. And I really like that idea. And what Lance and I realized as we talked about this is if we only have one chance to do it, we might as well go big. And the reason is a funny one. We're not saying going small is unimportant or meaningless or not fruitful or not very rewarding. It is. But we also know that there aren't enough smart, dedicated people trying to save the oceans. To save the oceans one square kilometer or one village at a time. That has to happen. And we want it to happen. but. It has to happen much faster than that process can lead us to. And so that led us to the big idea of the Global Ocean Refuge System, or GLORIES. And the name is on purpose, like biological diversity and ancient forests and sky truth. I, I think this idea, this name, is one that resonates. And Kiki, it was our beloved Sarah, who came up with glories, because I was calling it gores, and gores didn't sound, it sounded like Al Gore's, okay? She said, how about glories? It sounds a lot better, and it will, for religious people, they will say, you want to save the glories of the earth? We love it. And I, okay, I'll take my friends where I can get them, okay? So what we want glories to be is a diversified portfolio. Think of it as this is our retirement account. 
and we want the places to be strongly protected and well enforced, and we want these places to have enough representativity, replication, and dispersion to maintain resilience in a world that's getting really, really unattractive for life. It's getting hot, it's getting acidic, it's getting ugly out there, and we want to save things as best we can under those circumstances. And what we want to do is accelerate the process so that we can get protection for 20% of these ecosystems in each of the world's biogeographic regions. That includes all the different kinds of ecosystems in each of these regions. Because we figure if we do that, we have a pretty good chance of getting life through what is to come. Now, I got to tell you, Glories isn't the answer to all problems. It's not going to stop terrorism. It's not going to stop hatred. It's not going to stop climate change. It's not going to make all fisheries sustainable. Okay, we have to do that in other ways that are complementary to glories, but glories won't do it in and of itself. But what glories will do, I think, is create refuges that give us biological resilience. If we protect enough of the right places, marine life can recover, at least most marine life. A lot of marine life can recover when bad things happen. So what we want to do is reduce the risk of mass extinction. We want this to become the world's marine life insurance policy. We want it to work for people who are not altruistic, but who ask the question first and foremost, what's in it for me? We want to change the dynamic in marine conservation. In effect, we want to tilt the table in favor of conserving marine life. And of course, just in case you didn't think so, we want to create lots and lots of jobs for people like many of you, OK? Because you're going to be part of this if this works. And it rests on two pillars. One is what we know and believe we know about the geography of marine life. And the other is what we know and believe we know about the way people behave. So I want to talk about these two things quickly. Marine life is diverse, and different ecosystems have different species. It's not enough to save Pacific remote islands because there are no Arctic organisms to speak of in Pacific remote islands, or Antarctic organisms, or nearshore estuarine organisms, or things like that. You have to save viable samples, enough replicates of viable samples of all the kinds of ecosystems to save as many taxa as possible. And so you have to ask, are they in all of the regions, in all of the ecosystem types? Are they big enough to host viable populations? Because if a population isn't viable, then you know why bother? Are there enough of them to get connectivity and resilience, the portfolio effect? Are they dispersed enough to avoid a bad thing that happens in one place that takes out everything you've worked to save? So you gotta, you gotta make sure you don't have all your eggs in one basket, right? And are they as far as possible from harm's way? Because we're in a race here. We're in a race as the world gets warmer, the oceans get more acidic, and we need to not lose the things we care about right off the bat so that by the time things get better, uh, the biota are gone, and that's not a working model that I like very much. We want to save them as long as possible, right? That's, that's the game for us. And so just so you know, the sea and the land are different in a lot of ways. They're similar in a lot of ways, too, but they're different in a lot of ways. The gradient Remember where I worked on blue crabs? The gradient from ter in terrestrial dominance on aquatic climate is extremely important for marine organisms. So is the fact that the sea is, is layered. It's, it's three-dimensional 
in a way that the land is not. It's also four-dimensional in a way the land isn't, but let's not even talk about that one, okay? The important thing is they're different, and if you want to save the sea, you got to do it the way the sea needs to be saved, because things work differently for benthic organisms and for pelagic organisms, right? You, you, you know you need connectivity, but it means different things for different taxa and functional groups and such. So here's the basic idea, right? If you want your network to work, you have to allow metapopulation dynamics to the maximum extent practicable. So if these guys get wiped out by something bad, these guys, by just doing what comes naturally, feeding themselves and reproducing themselves, can recolonize the places where those were. They, they, they can rescue them. And can this work for highly migratory species? I, I can imagine the objection I'm going to hear. Oh, that's true, but for highly migratory species, no area is large enough to contain them. Well, it doesn't have to, OK? Because what scientists are learning by using biologging is where things go. And if you know where humpback whales spent their winters and spend their summers, and maybe you have an idea, although this is tougher, of knowing where they are when they commute between them, you can start using protected areas in the same way that the United States and Canada used Aransas National Wildlife Refuge and Wood Buffalo National Park to save hooping cranes. Those are the only two places where hooping cranes lived. And by saving their feeding habitat during the winter and their breeding habitat, uh, we avoided so far the extinction of hooping cranes. OK, so that's the, the biogeography kind of stuff, the ecology and biogeography. What about human behavior? And I take my lesson from the president who was in office starting when I was five years old, Dwight Eisenhower, and he said, the important thing about leadership is getting other people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. Not because you want them to do it, but because they want to do it. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And because I see how people take pride in their stuff, like their fish and their houses and their cars. Everybody likes to have the stuff. I, I, I had a person who didn't like me very much invite me over for dinner again and again so I would admire his Marc Chagall print, you know? And people like showing off their stuff. People like being recognized, okay? Now, if you don't recognize who this is, just wait about a week and a half. I think you're gonna be hearing a lot more, okay? And it's not only individuals like being recognized, but countries being made of people, although they're very different in scale, act very much like three-year-olds, and they like being recognized too. Okay, so is that something we can use? Well, as it turns out, prestige and money are really, really powerful incentives. And you have non-governmental organizations that are really good at getting people of all sorts to compete for the honor of rewards, uh, of awards that nonprofits give. And so that's what we want to do. That's what Glories is. It's designed to incentivize governments to compete for the honor of having their MPAs designated as global ocean refuges. OK? We want to incentivize governments. Now, wait a second. I said I wanted to change the dynamic. I have, I have worked on policy since 1978, and what I know is that governments mostly don't care what people think, but they pay attention to some people some of the time because they have to for their own sake. We want the governments to do it, not because we want them to do it, but because they come to want to do it. We want to do it by awarding global ocean refuge status to the world's best marine protected areas. So officials and officials will advance in their careers. Governments will get recognition because if they get global ocean refuges, 
money is going to come their way, prestige is going to come their way from sectors like these. So the process is like this. Marine scientists figure out the criteria for what's most needed in the system. Governments come to them and say, hello, marine scientists, we have some really, really good MPAs we think you should take a look at and see if they merit global ocean refuge status. And the Glory's partners then decide who gets the awards. See? So these places should be places of highest conservation importance. They should be survivable in a world that's surely going to get to be very uncomfortable. They need to be well managed and well enforced. And to the extent that it's compatible with the other things, we want them to help local people. We want them to be a net plus wherever possible. What I mean by important places are ecosystems that are unlike any other, ecosystems that have high species richness, places where organisms feed or breed or raise their young, and migration routes that connect them, and other sites that offer metapopulation benefits, right? And we think if this happens, the criteria will be shaped by scientists, people in the know. They'll be vetted by advocates and officials so we know they can work, and they'll be applied by the Glory's partners. We think the system can work. It had better work because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I am a grandfather. I have four grandchildren, not biological grandchildren, but I love them to pieces anyway. And it might not happen in my lifetime, but in your lifetimes, it's much more likely. And in their lifetimes, I think it's really likely that bad stuff is going to go down unless we look out for their interests big time. Now, some of you may say, OK, L, we can't do it this way. We've always done it a different way. We can't change the game. Don't try to change the game. This woman who lived in the building where I lived, Grace Hopper, knew how bureaucracies work and don't work. And she said, don't tell me we've always done it this way. Lance announced the, the uh, existence of glories in 2013 at the International Marine Conservation Congress in Lance, where remember, Marseille, OK? And I have to remind you of something. We are a pipsqueak organization. We are small in size and small in money. I hope not small in intellect or heart. But Margaret Mead, who was brilliant, who was a social scientist who, who changed the world in a number of ways, an imperfect human being like most of us, who did really big things, said that this is what it takes to make things change. So whether you're like a biodiversity fan and you say, we should do it for the sake of the living things, or you're anthropocentric and you say, we should do this for the people who need the ocean's living things, that's not the important thing. The important thing is we got to do this. And as my hero, and, and I only knew him a little, Carl Sagan said, if we don't speak for the Earth, who will? And I think that's the existential question. Are we willing to speak for the Earth? Are we willing to change the way we do things so that we survive? And I think the answer should be yes. And I'm hoping that some of you are really involved in helping glories happen. And I want to say thank you very much very much for inviting me here. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Okay. Um, you repeat the questions because then the people see it. Okay. Sounds good. We have a, we've been inspired fairly well, and uh, we have time for a few questions for those who want to pose them. 
Sure. How do you get around on the bottom of the ocean fast? How do I get around on the bottom of the ocean fast? At this age? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Skates indeed. Yeah, I don't get around on the bottom of the ocean fast anymore at all, but I like that. I like that. Daniel, you want to call on people? or? Peter? Thank you, sir. Yep. Yep. Well, it, I mean, I don't have anything anymore, but what happened to it? Well, um, people realized that certain issues touch people to the core and they evoke really strong reactions, and so a lot of people have backed away from population as an issue. Uh, a consequence being that the Earth's population, which we thought was headed for 9.3, 9.5 billion, now appears to be headed for 11 billion. Uh, 11 billion people on this piece of real estate is not a number that we can sustain at equilibrium. We have shot way past what the Earth can support, and that worries me. I'm with you. I think zero population growth is... I don't mean the organization, I mean the concept is crucial. I think we're going to have to cut back so we have enough earth to support the people we have without ruining the piece of real estate that keeps us alive. Yep. Yep. No. Uh, if you multiply the power of an individual boat times thousands or tens of thousands, you get some pretty significant impacts. And uh, there are places in the world where people are fishing now for things this long because things this long, let alone this long, let alone 20 meters long, are, are gone. And so, uh, if you extrapolate that, that means we will be catching phytoplankton and bacteria in not too distant future. And that's not a world I really choose to live in. I prefer my microorganisms in blue cheese and wine and things like that, okay? Not in the oceans. Uh, I want there to be other things too. Please. Yeah. Um, yep. To what do you attribute that? And second, is that you find that discouraging? Um, w w am I am I a aware that things have peaked and seem to have leveled off? And is that discouraging to me? And the answer is, it's heartbreaking to me. It's heartbreaking to me. I. Uh, I see how much it, harder it is to raise money now for our organization and other organizations trying to do good things for the oceans than it used to be. And that is very discouraging to me because if that doesn't change, I think the answer to the question is a foregone conclusion. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And that worries me a lot. I will say this. Um, the world fluctuates, and there are things that are really big, and then we don't think about them anymore. I mean, acid rain is one you know something about, and your dad knows something about. And there's less discussion of that today than there used to be. Issues go in and out of favor as awareness about them and culture evolves. I am hoping that we will become more aware again. And, and that's just a hope. You know, hope isn't a strategy. But on the other hand, if we don't fight as hard as we can 
to be ready to have the right stuff when circumstances favor us, we're out of luck. Please. Well, uh, yep, yep. Okay, so the question is, how do you deal with a country and a world where people like Mr. McConnell and Mr. Boehner are driving a lot of the agenda, or at least stopping a lot of things from happening. And, and my answer is, and this too shall pass. And I hope it just passes soon enough. And it's not because I'm a Democrat. It's not about Democrats and Republicans. I mean, my, my boss at the Council on Environmental Quality was a Nixon Republican. And I've worked in Republican and Democratic administrations and seen good things happen from President Bush and President Obama. It isn't to me a matter of party, but there's something that's correlated with that that worries me a lot. And to be perfectly honest, I don't care if we destroy the oceans for the benefit of the rich or destroy the oceans for the benefit of the poor, okay? I just want us to not destroy the oceans. Uh, so that's the best answer I can give you. And I know hope isn't the strategy, but here's something that I learned from reading books from people like Peter Ward and others. The first rule of the game is to stay in the game. And if you drop out of the game, it's over. If you stay in the game, you may not win. Yeah. But you may. You may. And that's why I'm doing it. Uh, who did I, I missed a hand? Oh, I'm sorry. I was okay. Yeah, Daniel. You mentioned Yellowstone mm -hmm. and you mentioned the Serengeti. Mm -hmm. And in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. Buffalo are back. Mm -hmm. They're spilling over and being hunted. Mm -hmm. In the Serengeti, elephants and rhinos are worse off than they ever have been. Mm -hmm. Okay. Refu and, and, and now, should I repeat that? Okay, you, you, they heard it. The important thing is that refuges are nothing if they are what I call poops, parks only on paper. Okay, we don't need more poops. We need refuges that are not only protected in law, but protected in fact. And I think there are a number of things that people can do to dramatically increase compliance with laws that society finds just and worthwhile. And it's not an easy thing to do when people are hungry. But on the other hand, what you said before about Yellowstone, that Yellowstone produces such a surplus of buffalo that a lot of buffalo are shot in the areas around Yellowstone. What does that remind me of? Oh, like fishing, right? No, 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 no am, I, am I wrong though? Are there not wolves appearing in places they haven't been for a century or nearly a century? Aren't there, you know, you, you know American bison's population went from being 30 to 60 million to a low of about 600 individuals. Now, you can shoot buffalo in the surrounding states. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a truth. I think that's an interesting truth. Something worked about Yellowstone for these species. Please, I've kept you guys too long. You said that when you were a kid, you felt the weight of the world on your shoulders. Yep. Not all on me. I just took responsibility for it. Why did you feel it was your responsibility and how can you convince more people? 
my father was a furrier. He, he made mink coats for wealthy women, and he was willing to do that, but he hated the idea of making lynx coats, which he did. My mother had lost her baby brother in World War II at age 18, and he was fighting to save our country from what he thought was a terrible apocalyptic vision that he couldn't endure. And that was the family I was born into. And they brought me up to take life seriously, to act as if life matters. And I didn't have a choice. I just, they bent me that way, and that's how I grew. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much, folks. So you have the talk on this. So if that's of use to you. Yeah, Brooke. Yeah, we have the talk. Brooke's hopefully got it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, is that bad news? No, that's good. Okay. Okay.